We appreciate having you here today, and I want to welcome everyone to the Southwest Word Fiesta. And just let everyone know our sponsors are Western New Mexico University and the town of Silver City. And we want to uh, start our conversation with Catherine Hollibird uh, with some reading from one Thank of the you. chapter books. And then we'll go on to questions. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be virtually in Silver Lake with you and to be at the Word Fiesta. This is such a great occasion. So I'm really excited to be part of it. And uh, I've got some new chapter books that I've just started writing. Uh, I've got two of them here today and I'd, I'd like to read to you from one of them because it's been really fun having my character, Angelina Ballerina, go into a more expanded world where I can take her on, on longer and, and more complicated adventures than you can do in a 600 word children's storybook. So these chapter books, which are five chapters, 2,500 words, uh, I've been doing them for the last year. And this is number two, and there are four in all. So I'm going to read you. Uh, and this, this is called Angelina Ballerina's Ballet Tour. And Angelina goes with her beloved ballet teacher, Miss Lily, and her ballet class on a tour of a dancing tour around Mouseland. And I'm going to start with chapter two, when Miss Lily tells everyone what exciting parts they're going to play in the performance of Mouserella. Angelina and her friends couldn't wait to hear what ballet Miss Lily would choose for them to perform. What's your favorite ballet? Miss Lily asked them. All the little dancers raised their hands and shouted, Mouserella. Then it's decided. We'll perform Mouserella for the tour, said Miss Lily. Hooray, I love Mouserella, and re-shouted. Miss Lily got to work deciding who would dance each role in the ballet. And by the next class, she had announcements to make. William will be the prince, Miss Lily said. Alice and Susie will be the naughty stepsisters. Angelina held her breath and waited impatiently to hear Miss Lily call her name. She adored Mousarella and she really wanted to dance the lead part. Angelina, you will be Mousarella's magical fairy godmother, Miss Lily said. Angelina's face crumpled. Henry will be Mousarella's charming little coachman, and Flora will dance the part of Mousarella, continued Miss Lily. Angelina's tail drooped, and she stared glumly at her slippers. There she is, with her tail drooping, staring glum. I know you'll do a wonderful dance as the fairy godmother, said Miss Lily, as she gave Angelina a hug. It's a very special, fun role. I also need you to be my tour helper. You're a fine dancer and everyone looks up to you. Okay, Miss Lily, said Angelina, wiping away her tears. <laughs> Poor Angelina. But Angelina soon realized there was much more to a ballet tour than she knew even before the tour began. Every day after school, Angelina and her friends met at Miss Lily's ballet school to practice all their ballet positions and prepare for the tour. Angelina quickly learned the part of the fairy godmother, and then she helped Miss Lily at, re at rehearsals by leading the other dancers. Angelina and her friends also helped Miss Lily organize and pack all the costumes and ballet slippers, plus extra ribbons and a sewing kit, and they helped paint all the scenery too. Even though it was hard work, the preparations were fun and exciting. When she was at home, Angelina told her mother that she was still sad that she couldn't be Mousarella. Angelina's mother sewed shining sequins and wings onto her fairy costume. But when Angelina looked in the mirror, she wished she were in Mousarella's sparkling ball gown. I know how much you wanted to be Mousarella, her mother said kindly, but dancers have to perform all sorts of different parts. This time is Flora's turn to take the lead. The day before the tour, Angelina carefully packed her suitcase with her fairy godmother costume, her tutu and slippers, her pajamas and toothbrush, and a comfy outfit for the, for the bus ride. There was one last thing to pack, Mousy. Mousy, you're coming on tour with me, said Angelina, hugging her favorite stuffed toy. You always help me get to sleep. Soon the Mousarella tour would begin. 
Angelina wasn't sure she was asleep at all. And then she goes off on the big blue bus, the mozzarella tour. And a lot of thrilling things happen. Wow. <laughs> you see that with me, the original Angelina doll today. Oh, yeah. Stuffed toy. Yeah, yeah, this was made by American Girl back in the 80s. Um, and it, it just, I think, captures very much her, her whole persona. <laughs> always, yeah. you know, always eager, uh, kind of a tomboy in a ballet costume. <laughs> Yeah. Well, our cat used to take that mouse, so we had to put her up on a tall shelf in Erin's closet because yes, she's cat very cute. Cool, the cat loved it. Yeah, <laughs> carrying carrying Angelina around in her mouth. Yeah, <laughs> that's very funny. Mm. <laughs> a rather large mouse for a cat. This one. Yeah, that was that was some cat. <laughs> So we've been doing a lot of new Angelina books and you know, we have this uh, wonderful publishing program with Simon and Schuster now, and they're bringing out refreshed ed editions of all these books. So I, I'm just, thrilled. This, I don't know if you have this in your library, Big City Ballet. Not yet, but I will. When, yeah, this is when we well, keep, keep uh, have a look at their uh, page, Simon and Schuster's page because their website, because they have all of them on there. And I just think they're doing a wonderful job and it's beautiful to see the classic books come back. And this one, Angelina goes to um, the Big Cheese because we, we were trying to think of a place Angelina hadn't been because she'd been all over Mouseland. And then I thought, well, she's never been to a big city and we'll call it the Big Cheese. And Helen Craig actually did research on New York City, looked at a lot of photographs. She, no, I don't, Helen's never been to New York City, but anyway, she, you know, she she captured a lot of the of the flavor. And this story of the little country mouse going to the big city was a lot of fun. And she, and she, of course, she dances. And then this one, oh, this is Angelina, the Royal Wedding. I did a lot with royalty. It was fun. I was living in England and, you know, people, there are always those royals around. So Angelina in Mouseland, they have a king and queen and a royal family. And Angelina and Henry got to go and they got, yes, had a serious misadventure in the palace, but it all works out fun in the end. I mean, I've had so much fun writing these stories because, you know, such a, she's a great character to write about. She's very passionate. She's very determined. She's kind of feisty. She means so well. She's got a little heart of gold, but, you know, she get, and she gets into herself into trouble, into scrapes and mistakes and, and has to find a way out. So I think those challenges are always, they make it really fun to write about as a character. Um, and of course I've been doing, um, I've started writing another series about a little fairy called Twinkle. You know these books? Yeah, mm -hmm. tell us about Twinkle. Uh, what's the so, Twinkle is a, a, a fairy and obviously, <laughs> but, but made her, and this is an English, another English illustrator. Uh, her name is Sarah Warburton. She lives in Bristol and I think she's just, she, like Helen, she has a wonderful sense of humor in everything she does, and she captures a lot of, um, you know, childlike charm and and char a strong character in her illustrations. And Twinkle lives in uh, the Sparkle Tree Forest. Again, these end papers show this wonder wonderful illustrator wow. creating this magical forest for Twinkle and her friends, and there and all the forest creatures too. She just uh, love her work. And uh, what I wanted to do was create a child fairy. Now, fairies tend to be grown-up fairies, and I didn't think there was a little child fairy. So this is a little girl fairy going to the fairy school of magic and music. And they learn spells and things, but she's not very good at them. So she makes yeah. terrible spell mistakes. <laughs> she, gets, she, she tries her best to make a really great spell and everything goes wrong. So mayhem ensues. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Sarah Ward Burton did such a good job showing the uh, here when when the spell goes wrong in the middle of the night and wakes up all the forest creatures. So they're all uh, who's making the rackets reach the owl? Stop the ruckus! Shouted the squirrel. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but another um, delightful character to write about and wonderful illustrator to work with. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. And the other thing that's happening now is some of these, this was a, Angelina's Invitation to the Ballet. Have you ever seen this one? 
Oh, it looks great. I'm, it is great. I love this one because it was one of the beautiful, uh, when we were with Puffin in England and Penguin here, um, we did a lot of these specialty books and this was one of my favorites because it has, uh, literally it has the invitations in it. And there's the first invitation. It's an invitation to go to the ballet. Oh, no, and this and and that so this book is wonderful for teaching children about writing because if I go to a school and and they ask me, well, how to write a book? And I say, Well, think about it. You've got a character, and the character has to live somewhere. So you have to have a place. Where's the character character gonna be? Where are they living? And what is their problem? Because if everything if they just go to school and have a happy day and go home, that's not much of a story, is it? So we've got to create a problem. And there are seven letters in, in uh, this book. So each letter has to create a new problem for Angelina so that she can't get to the ballet until the very end. And that's, you know, and then, then you see how it works because each time, you know, Alice can't go with her because she's going to a, a birthday party. William can't go because he's playing football. Uh, Henry has to go to the doctors, you know, on and on. Anyway, great fun. And they're bringing this out now again too, uh, Simon Schuster. So I'm excited about that. Yes, and you have some questions. Indeed, um, yes. I guess maybe it might be nice to start with uh, when did you start imagining stories and when did you start writing them down in your life? <laughs> <laughs> I was a very, I, I was a very, uh, I was a little child who loved stories and told stories and I used to, I had three sisters growing up and we made up dances and performances all the time. And I made up little stories to go with it. And it was so much fun. And it's, again, something that when I'm writing about Angelina just comes back, that childhood of making things up and make-believe, because when you're little, make-believe is so wonderful and so important. That line between reality and imagination is not so strong. And so I was, uh, I love I love making up stories. And then I went to, uh, when I was in university, I was a literature major. And I hadn't really figured out about writing for children until I, w I had children of my own. And I, met, and I met Helen Craig. And, you know, when I did this first book with Helen, uh, and I had this opportunity to write a children's story, the idea of this little dancing character, this determined feisty little character in a tutu who was very much like my daughter, wanted to dress up and go to ballet classes, but was always having some huge drama was happening, you know, she's ending up in tears. So that was very inspiring. But yeah, I've always loved to write. So writing comes quite naturally. But it helps to have a wonderful character like Angelina. I mean, really, you're going to write a children's, people ask about writing children's books. And I think you, you really need to find a good character um, that has a lot of resonance for children that they can relate to easily. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that relates to them and something that comes from your experience and yes. view. And, and she shares a lot of their, you know, children have big feelings and they have big emotions. And so Angelina personifies a lot of that. She has, yeah, what do you have? She, you us, she gets angry. She she gets, she makes mistakes and she and she recovers and she's very resilient. I think she's a good role model too. I was going to... I hope so. Anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. I was going to say that, you know, these books, children's books in general, play a role in helping kids process big emotions, uh, books like this, and, and even as they get older. And I wondered, yeah. how do you see that role for books in engaging children and helping them to deal with their big things? I think it's a very, I think it's a very important role. And I, and I feel very privileged to write for children because I think it is these books do play a big part in their early lives and their development. And I'd like to think that the stories I write that resonate with children and also will resonate with their parents. And that these are these are these books might be occasions for them to talk about certain problems because when Angelina gets jealous, you know, do you get jealous too? How do you what do we do when we get jealous? You know, how do we handle it? And um, and Angelina at the fair, Angelina doesn't want to take her little cousin Henry to the fair. She wants to go with her friends. And so she's not very nice to him right in the beginning. 
And, and you know, if you read that to children, ask them, what was going on? You know, why did Angelina feel that way? And so, and I, do you ever feel that way? And they say, yes, I do. <laughs> I get so angry at my mother or something. So I do think it helps them to, to talk about and think about these big emotions that are so can be so overwhelming and the experiences they have with siblings and things like that. Yeah. And, and maybe it's a way for parents to talk to children too. I think, you know, when you're reading stories with children, it's a lovely time, calm time to talk things, talk about things that are important. Like feelings are very important. Yeah, that makes sense. So you, um, you know, you, you've told us how your uh, your life experience has fed into uh, Angelina Ballerina. And um, as far as imagining her world, uh, what oh. what you to well, I had a lot of I had a lot of help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Helen Craig is a genius illustrator. I mean, I think beyond the beyond of illustrators. And working with her has been just a great joy. She's in her 80s now, and she lives on her own, and she's now doing a lot of sculpture and things. I mean, she goes into her studio and works every day. And during the time when we were creating all the classic Angelina books, there were about, I don't know, 20, 25 we did together. And then there's so many of these, you know, we there are many, these are called spin-offs, books that are created from our stories, but they're not, because they, they sell at different price points. So they're not as expensive. And they use a clone illustrator. And Helen's okay with that because the, the, the books we did together typically took her nine months to illustrate because she's an incredible perfectionist. And her artwork is so intricate. In, in, intricate. And together, we would just sit down and talk through a story. I would come to her and say, I'm thinking about doing a story, for example, about Angeline and her grandparents. And wouldn't it be fun if she went on a barge? And, now, and then Helen and I went to a barge museum. We really found one in, uh, there was one uh, in London because London has a big canal going, you know, there's a canal going, the Camden Canal goes through London. And so we went and, and looked at the barges and she, you know, had so much fun creating this world um, for Angelina on the barge. But Helen grew up in England in the forties and her, she grew up in Oxfordshire in a little village and her, how, her cottage had a thatched roof, like Angelina. So she used all of that background of her life in the 40s when there was no electricity. So if you look at some of the early books, uh, Angelina's Christmas, and so, there are gas lamps and things in the background. So Mouseland is very authentically old Britain in a way. <laughs> and I'm has wonderful villagey touches because Helen really lived in that world. Oh. And... And knows it very well. And, and of course, you know, I met her in London. I was living in London. Angelina is in some ways a very British character, even though I'm an American writer, because she belongs so much to that, uh, that look that Helen created from her own childhood and her experiences in Oxfordshire. And I mean, they have, you know, it's so enhanced the books. I think Helen's work, Helen's, uh, vision of her childhood. I don't have Angelina's Christmas here, but there's a wonderful photograph, uh, I've photo illustration, sorry, of um, of the village, of the winding street of the village and Angelina dancing along in the snow. And it's so atmospheric. Uh, and it is, I mean, it's straight out of her childhood and her memories. I mean, that village now has cars and it's busier and, you know, more people, but she goes back again and again to this timeless village. And mm -hmm. There's another uh, illustration I adore from Angelina's birthday when Angelina and her little friend Alice go into Mrs. Thimble's general store. And Helen said that general store was her favorite place growing up. In, and everything, and it, it had everything for sale, you know, sold fruit and veg and everything, but it also had, you know, when you look at the illustrations, I mean, you can spend hours looking at it because it's got pots and pans and, I don't know, brooms and rugs and kettles and everything and and so that's also straight out of Ellen's childhood so the books were incredibly enriched by that by that world that Helen uh, was able to create wow that's amazing yeah yeah 
So Helen is informing the text and the story as much as the text and the story are informing the illustration. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing that I think between us, it was tremendous serendipity and, and empathy. I, we get along really well. But the other thing, the character of Angelina, we both really understood it. But I always wanted her to, to be innocent, like a very young child, full of that ebullience and energy of young children. And Helen captures the emotions and the expressiveness with this body of a mouse in the most extraordinary way. I mean, when the mouse, when Angela's happy, her tail is up and her ears up and everything's up and she's dancing. And when she's sad, everything droops and her tail goes down, dries. And it's just, I, I couldn't have asked for anything. I mean, it, it really has made the books outstandingly, I mean, outstanding and special that, to have had such an illustrator, so. I, every time I live in New York now, but every time I go to London, I go and see, I go out and she's outside of Cambridge. I go up and we have tea, sit in the garden, have tea, all very British. <laughs> <laughs> and we have wonderful, wonderful memories of working together. So this was in the 80s. So you were probably yeah. mostly collaborating one on one, face to face. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, we were not Zooming. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. We, we would, uh, well, we, I would call her up. She was, uh, I was in London, North London. You know, I, I was there for um, 30 years living in London. My children all born there. And uh, so she was in Oxfordshire. Recent, about 10 years ago, she moved to another, another not thatched cottage, a little more modern, comfortable in her old age. But um, she lived in a little thatched cottage that her aunt had left her in a town called uh, Tim. And it was about an hour and a half from London. So I would just drive out and spend the day with her. We'd go over everything um, and, and you know, laugh. And I, I we were just, we were just so lucky because we both, we had fun doing it too. It wasn't like it was hard. <laughs> it was just brilliant. Uh, and have we, I don't even think we had very many um disagreements of her. I think she would, I would send her my story. Well, I tell her what I was thinking of doing. She'd say, oh, that's interesting. And maybe make a suggestion or two. And then I go and write it, which take, I don't know, a month or two and to get a rough draft and something I felt was, was really good to show. And then she'd sit down and, and do a, a very rough, uh, a very rough sketch of what we call, well, this is what's called a dummy in publishing. It's a dummy book. And this is sort of a typical, this is uh, Angelina's, uh, from Angelina's, what is it, Big City Ballet, which I showed you the beautiful cover of. But this is how her work looks in the beginning. And it's very, very sketchy. And uh, and you can see we're working, we're still, we're still changing the text and working on it. So this is, you know, we she would create a dummy like this. And then um, we just take it from there step by step, it goes through quite a lot of processes. And, and you know, we also had wonderful publishing partners who made the book so beautiful. Um, all of our, all of Helen's originals are now in the Children's uh, Book Center. The, is it called the Children's? It's the National Book Center of Britain in Newcastle called Seven Stories. Mm -hmm. And it, when I was, yeah, 12 years ago when I was moving back to the States, I said, I'm going to leave them. And Helen and all Helen's beautiful artwork was in a shed outside her house, in a garden shed. I mean, beautiful, airtight and everything. But I said, Helen, what if something happens? You know, we've got to put this. So we went up there and loved uh, the place. And Seven Stories now is, has Helen's work in their archive, if anybody ever wants to see it. That's great. Yeah. 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 So I wonder. Um taking a little detour, um, if someone were an aspiring children's book author, hmm. would you have any advice as to, you know, if they think they have a manuscript that's ready to be looked at, you know, what would they do next? That's a very vexed question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd like to be able to say, well, just go out and get yourself an agent, but that's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you can do is find out who is publishing stories like your story. Who who is the publisher who's interested in this material? You know, um, you if you look at children's publishers, or you um, 
by those big publishing manuals. You can you can research it and you can find out. I mean, who is most likely to be interested? That's one thing. The other is you've got to make sure that you're following the protocol for these books, which is pretty tight, actually. You know, my Angelina books, Angelina illustrated storybooks are generally 600 words, six, maybe 700, which is, you know, when you look at the pages, it means that the, the, the illustrator is going to tell a lot of the story. Mm -hmm. so you've got to be sure that what you're, what you're telling, the part you're telling is going to, is going to showcase the illustrations. You can't tell the whole story. You have to leave a good part of it for the illustrations. And also you have to make sure, I think the big mistake people make is they overwrite. They have mm -hmm. a manuscript that's way too long, you know, because we all, it's very hard when you're writing music. It's so, what I'm writing is so interesting and I really want it to be great and I'm gonna keep writing. And then somebody says, no, you really need half of that or make sure it fits this one because this is a format. And, and, and actually, it's, you know, some books are inc incredibly, I'm trying to think of an example now, Children's story books have very few words, but they're but it works because they they're so spot on, and the illustrations are telling so much of the story and are so funny. Um, so so you don't need to belabor the text generally, and also people sometimes I've seen people trying to rhyme and things. I read a rhyme book once; it's really hard, <laughs> and uh, and it's probably better not to try and rhyme your first time around. Um, and, and I think also you can't, I, I think you can submit to, I have an agent I've had for a long time, but I think you could submit things to agents as well as to publishers. I mean, it'd be nice to, you know, you want somebody to have your back in this business. Yeah. That and I would sense. say, looking back, I wish I'd known more about contracts. <laughs> it's good to be aware of what you're signing. Uh, you're so excited to get published. You're kind of ready to sign anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, when Angelina became a brand, I had no idea what was going on with the, you know, because it's, there are two different contracts. One's a publishing world and one is a, uh, a rights holder about the exploitation, what they call exploitation rights. That sounds terrible, but it really means exploiting the character to create other entertainment animation, for instance. Angelina was a, you know, has been in, they've done a lot of animation of Angelina, both uh, in England and the USA. And um, Angelina was a ballet in Great Britain. Um, so they are the producers and you have a publisher and a producer. But anyway, that's that's another story and that that was extremely um, fortunate and not not usual. But you know, if you, if you choose the right character and it takes off, that's what happens. Is there, somewhat of, is there somewhat of a controlled vocabulary? I imagine there would be for easy readers. Yes. But for easy. For the yeah. books. For a children's storybook you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a that's a really good question. Is there control? I, when I'm writing, and here's another thing to say to young authors. When you write for children, read what you're writing out loud. Sit down and read it out loud. How's it going to sound to the child who's listening? Is it funny? Is it going to engage them? Are they going to be Really, you got to, the story has to captivate them, you know, can't just because they are not an easy audience and they'll walk away in a second if they if they don't like it. Um, and the other thing is you're writing for parents because they've got to read it over and over and over again. So it does. I think the the I always read my work out loud to myself lots of times as I'm writing. And I and I think language is very important. I really care about the language that I'm using for little children. Um, and the message that you're giving, I think generally positive and fun and uplifting, but with, you know, the background of challenges of childhood and that sort of thing. That's, that's anyway what interests me. And uh, I, I would just say to writers, yeah, read it out loud. Be very careful of, of the language. Engage, you're engaging a very young audience. So use humor and things that they love. They love humor, you know. Turns out they love pathos too because Angelina's life is full of humor and pathos. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us about um, any 
particular uh, books or authors, whether they're from uh, a while back or more recently mm -hmm. that uh, are standing out to you or something that has really stuck with you um, that's uh, significant in, in the children's picture book world? Yeah, I you know, I've lived in Britain so long. I, I lived there, you know, most of the books that I was reading to my children and buying were very British, obviously. Um, so I'm trying to think of, and the books that I loved as a child, and I and again, I still adore them, uh, are now, you know, classics like Charlotte's Web, or the idea that you could speak to animals and they could understand, you could understand them and talk. I just, that, that to me was just so thrilling. Um, I, you know, I love Dr. Zeus and I read Dr. Zeus to my children and I'm reading it to my grandchildren. It's so funny. And incredibly funny now it doesn't matter does it is it this is the timelessness of writing such beautiful uh books for children i love raul Dahl. i know that he's in some people think he's uh you know some of his books are very very dark but you know i think it i think he was also showing children adults can be you know you can't trust everybody out there you can't all those adults aren't aren't uh, they're not all terrible witches I don't know they were pretty dark but I did love I do love them um and, and again in Britain Beatrix Potter although I, honestly I think Helen Craig is every bit the illustrator Beatrix Potter is and they just had a big show at the Morgan Library here in New York of Beatrix Potter but I think they should do one of Helen Craig maybe one day mm -hmm. um what other books I mean I I'm, I'm trying to think what I've read uh, more recently to my grandchildren because, you know, the, but they're, you see, they're boys. And so it's very difficult because I'm just reading these little boy books. <laughs> 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 and, um, oh, The Curious George was a, you know, it's been a big hit. These are sort of timeless books, aren't they? I mean, that was another character that just kept developing and growing because they had a good character. They, they, uh, the writer knew how to develop it and create more and more funny stories about this little monkey. So children really go for that. Oh. And it, by the way, it doesn't have to be, you know, people writing about, like me, about, people think I'm writing about a mouse. I'm writing about a child. And uh, that's, it, it's wonderful to use animals. They're so uh, darling in books and so, so cute and everything. Uh, and as Helen says, mice are wonderful little dancers, even though their legs are sort of backwards when they're trying to do <laughs> mouse positions. I mean, ballet positions. But um, but but yeah, animals are wonderful. But you're really writing for children about children. So they seem to immediately make that leap. Don't yeah, they? yeah, yeah. They they oh, immediately like. You've got little boys, haven't you? So you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, it doesn't matter to them. They they say, oh, yeah, it's just like me. Yes, that's right. Oh, Mo Willem's books are a good example, aren't they? He, the, the uh, what is it, The Pig and the Elephant. Oh, yeah. And they're very brief. This is the ones I have read to my boy grandchildren. They love them. They're, they're, the writing is very brief, isn't it? Very, um, it's almost poetic, you know, just tiny, tiny. But the humor is so huge. And the, and the interaction between the pig and the elephant is so hilarious. You know, the adult is laughing his head off as he's reading it to the child. Isn't that wonderful? What a gift. So that's why those books are so beloved, I think. Yeah, yes, for sure. With great uh, thanks to Helen Craig, who, you know, t devoted so much of her life and time to creating these books with me. And, and as I say, you know, for me, it was maybe six weeks, eight weeks. For her, it was nine months every time. Just, she has a uh, in her studio. She has a almost a you know five foot table, a big drafting board, like an architect's drafting board that she works on. So the originals are this beautiful original artwork, especially when she's doing a double page spread, um, like this one of the the famous barge that we researched in London. Um, these double page spreads, you know, she gets up every morning and she just keeps working on them until uh, until she gets it right. But it's here's an example. I mean, look at the number of 
mice in the audience and the uh, Angelina dancing. So this can take her up to a month to do just one. And she does it, you know, and has a big sheet of paper like that, this, and she starts with pencil and pencils that, well, and you saw, you know, we do a dummy where she sketched everything in, but then she does, does pencil and then she starts ink and watercolor. I mean, it's a very laborious process. Uh, and I say to children, you know, if you want to be this kind of illustrator, you have to be ready to get up every morning. And that's what you do. You have to love it. You go there and you sink into that wonderful world you're creating of these illustrations. But she did it all day, every day for months to make these beautiful books. Wow, that takes stamina. <laughs> well, writing takes stamina too. I mean, oh, yeah. It's sort of a different. I mean, when I'm writing, I, I use a computer generally now because. The, it's so wonderful to be able to change things around. It's so flexible. And every and so when I, I make a draft, I keep it with the date. And then the next day I start by reading the draft and I read it out loud. And I think how it's, and, and then I work on that draft. And then I put the date on it, put it. So every day, so you've got all these layers of drafts. And I can go back if I, if I think I messed up and go back, I can, I can see where it was before. And that way I, I know exactly how the story is moving. And uh, usually there are numerous drafts. I mean, it doesn't, you know, Angelina Ballerina was uh, extraordinary because when I wrote that story, my daughters were, I mean, when I wrote the original Angelina Ballerina text, my daughters, Tara, <clears throat> Tara and Alexandra were five and three. And they, and Tara only wanted to, for her birthday, she only wanted a pink tutu. So, I mean, that character was there. And then she wanted to wear it everywhere. You know, she never wanted to take it off. And then we got ballet lessons for them. And this was so exciting. So they were going to ballet school. But ballet school, you know, you had to learn the steps and you had to do them. And that was difficult. And then you, they had little performances. And oh, my God, you would have thought that we were dealing with the English National Ballet. It was so, it was such a big deal. And I just thought this character was just so fun. And also it was, it was very reminiscent of my own childhood. And, uh, and and then the whole piece about performing, because children love to get up on a stage and perform, even though it's terrifying, or, you know, for some. And uh, so I just thought, I want to write, I want to write about this. And I sat down and wrote it, and it came out pretty much the way it was. I mean, which is remarkable, really, because that doesn't generally happen. Never happened to me again. That was the, that was the only time. <laughs> but, but, you know, luckily, I mean, incredibly luckily, I had created this little character that had such um, such a, uh, a resonance and uh, such, she, she was so alive. Uh, and, and I also didn't mention in the beginning, but would like to say this is her 40th, this year is the 40th anniversary of Angelina Ballerina. The original book was published in 1983 in London. Wow. So it's nice we're doing this this year. Just celebrate, celebrate with you. Yeah. I'm glad you can celebrate that with us. We um, did have one other person join us on Zoom. Didn't know if they had any questions. Oh, okay. Um, just giving you a, an opening for that, if you'd like. Sure. Is there anybody there? <laughs> <laughs> but if not, that's okay, too. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, maybe before we wrap it up, uh, Maybe you can show us the Angelina doll one more time. Oh, yeah. There she is. <laughs> Angelina doll. And I mean, I, I really should show you some of the cute things of it, like this little book. I mean, this is typical of really brilliant um, brand management for from the from the publishers, because this is a, a ballet bag book, you know. Uh -huh. so you, and it's, you know, it's what's called a spin-off because it's based on the original books, but a uh, clone illustrator who works with Helen. They do work together to create a very similar look. I think they've done very, very well. And uh, that's one of them. So they're, oh, and they're ready to, a lot of actually ready to reads now in this new format. So uh, very excited that they are creating so many exciting books. And I'm ready to read in, with Twinkle too. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Twinkle has, has also got a, a lot of uh, very nice early readers and things. So it's um, nice to have those for the kids that 
their parents were reading them the picture book for a few years and then they're ready to try. Well, and that was the idea between about these uh, chapter books too, was that the child can then go on and read chapters, him or herself, and um, bring those skills. Yeah, very good yeah. skills. You know, it's funny. My my grandson, when he was little, I was, I also had some beautiful uh, puffin books. Penguin and Puffin that were, they opened out. There was an Angelina book that opened out and it had stage and all these little cut. And he used to play with it. And then when he was about five, he said to me one day, you know, Nana, I have to tell you something. And I said, it's okay, Max, you can tell me anything. He said, well, I don't like pink anymore. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely fine. <laughs> but this year he's 14 and I think he does like pink again because Lionel Messi is wearing a pink, has made these pink, you know, soccer they are selling out like hotcakes at Adidas. They can't keep up with the order. So pink is in. I'm just going to tell him. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> cool. Well, Catherine, I guess, you know, we've gone through our questions. and uh, well, It's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you. It's been wonderful to have you. We're so glad. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, you know, I, I love connecting with people and talking about it because it really has been such a remarkable journey. And I've been, you know, I've been so lucky to work with somebody, these two brilliant illustrators and create these books. So it's nice to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And we wish you well. Yes, um, it was wonderful. Thank you. Very nice yeah. talking to you both. Bye. 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 Thanks.